Um, so thanks everyone for joining us um, at the Gynecologic Cancer Initiative Virtual Town Hall. My name is Stephanie Lam. I'm the research coordinator for the GCI. Um, so we're quite excited today to um, share some of the great resources um, that support gynecologic cancer research. Um, so before we get started, I'd just like to take some time to acknowledge the traditional unceded territories that we're each joining from today. Um, so for myself, I'm joining from the territory of the Kwikwetlem First Nation. Um, so those territories lie within the shared nation of the Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, Musqueam, Kikite, Squamish, and Stolo nations. So I'd just like to encourage everyone just to take some time to think about the territories that you're joining us from today. Um, so we'll just jump into some brief housekeeping. So throughout the next hour, we'll be hearing from several speakers about different research initiatives and uh, resources for gynecologic cancer research. Um, so we welcome everyone to keep your cameras turned on if you feel comfortable with doing so. Um, but please um, try to keep your microphones muted for the duration of the presentations. Um, if you have any questions um, during the presentations, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll be addressing them at the very end. Um, there will also be an opportunity at the end to turn on your microphones uh, for discussion and questions um, if they come up. Another thing that I'd like to just note is that this meeting is being recorded. Um, so we'd also like to encourage everyone to just stay in touch with the Gynecologic Cancer Initiative. So if you're interested in any of the resources mentioned today, uh, please feel free to reach out to us uh, via email or any of the platforms listed on the screen here. Um, so we also encourage everyone to follow us on our new social media sites. Um, so those are platforms on Facebook, Instagram, as well as Twitter, um, and the handles are listed here and uh, we'll put them up on the screen um, at the end of the event as well. Um, so the first thing that we actually wanted to do today is just to take a virtual group photo of everyone on the call. Um, so I'm just going to uh, stop sharing my screen. And if you feel comfortable with being part of our group photo, I just encourage you to turn on your cameras and just give us a big smile. I'm going to take some screenshots so we can have the content. So here we go. Uh, and give everyone some time to turn on your cameras. And here we go. Okay, we're good. Thank you all for being taking part of that. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to turn everyone's attention to Dr. Gavin Stewart, who is our strategic lead for the GCI, who will say a few words about the GCI and moderate the rest of today's event. Well, thanks uh, very much, Stephanie. And uh, I, I should just say to everybody, I, I am really, really going to try to keep us on task and on time. We have till three o'clock and uh, I, I would ask uh, people to respect that. So um, I, I'm also gonna go off script a little bit and, and, and just say that I'm delighted with the people that are, have joined us. We have scientists, we have patient partners, we have uh, team members and uh, uh, we, we have partners from our foundations and development offices and I'm just absolutely delighted. I, 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 I will say a, a special welcome to two people because I, I, I do note that uh, uh, Dr. Yvette Drew has joined us from Newcastle and it's probably not two o'clock in the afternoon there. It's a little bit later, uh, but I'm delighted. And uh, also I see Dr. Iowa Kong from uh, Hamilton, uh, uh, another colleague in gynecologic cancer. So thanks very much for joining us folks. Um, I, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes just to start with because Many people do from time to time knock on my email and say, Gavin, what the heck is GCI? <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, I just wanted to clarify that that picture that we just took, that is, that is what GCI is. Uh, the Gynecologic Cancer Initiative is an opportunity that we have here in British Columbia. And I, I, I think it's unique to British Columbia. We have um, a, 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 a single province. We have slightly more than 5 million persons. We have a single cancer system. We have a publicly funded system for healthcare, and we have several key universities and our health authority partners. 
And what the Gynecologic Cancer Initiative is, is an aggregate of the talent across those jurisdictions that are working on research in gynecologic cancer. Because I'll say we realized, and I mean all of us, that if we work together on this, we have an opportunity in British Columbia to do something that nobody else in Canada, never mind outside of Canada, has an opportunity to do, which is to have a major impact on the pain and suffering caused by gynecologic cancer in the population that we serve. And uh, two years ago, we set a very bold and audacious goal, which was if we work together, if we aggregated all of the talents that you see on your cameras and in the, in, in, in the labs and offices, we could actually reduce pain and suffering from gynecologic cancer by 50 per, five zero percent if we worked together uh, in the population that we serve within the, uh, the, the, the next 10, 12 year period. And initially it was set as a 15 year goal, which takes us to 2030, uh, 33. But we actually think this is an achievable goal. So the GCI is you. It's all of us working together, patients, patients, partners, uh, uh, philanthropic organizations, development offices, foundations, scientists, in order to achieve that goal. And we believe that this actually can take place. How the GCI works, uh, we have a small core budget that has been provided through UBC um, as a cluster uh, research grant. And what that means, a cluster grant was an initiative brought forward by UBC a few years ago to bring together different people, different sectors, different jurisdictions who don't normally work together. And that sounded perfect for us. And when we applied for funding, we were successful. Um, I, I can tell all of you when we applied for renewed funding last year, one of the comments was made that this is how research should be done. And I think that's a huge accolade to everybody that's on the call right now. Uh, this, is, this is how it should be, is, is coming together with a common goal and we've been able to really sort of uh, push the boundaries. It is all about research. We're trying to increase research uh, in the population of women affected by ovarian cancer. And through that, we will increase the knowledge and improve outcomes. So I'm gonna stop there. That's all I really wanted to say. And I think the uh, next uh, piece is going to be uh, one of our star uh, uh, surgeon scientists, Jessica McAlpine, who's going to talk about the uh, tissue bank. So Jess, uh, take her away. Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, well, I guess I'll first start about uh, saying what a tremendous privilege it is to manage the bank. It, a bank's not possible without the incredible generosity of patients. Um, they're donating their tissue, not knowing if it'll help them, but might help others in the future. And it also, of course, requires the generosity of the foundations and individual donors to help keep it afloat. Started in 2005, leadership of Blake Jilks. Um, major research discoveries from British Columbia and internationally that are credited secondary to this bank, identifying that epithelial ovarian cancer is not a single disease, uh, novel gene discoveries, an ability to discover and study rare tumors, new tools in endometrial cancer. I think um, originally it was very much a lower mainland focus when the bank started. We now have this opportunity to follow patients over time wherever they live. And it's very important to us that we're not just representing patients in the lower mainland um, and that it actually looks at the needs for women all across of, uh, British Columbia. I will say that that is also a two-way street for investigators, researchers, clinicians who may be on this call. It's, it's very important for us that we know um, people feel they can reach out and access the bank for their clinical conundrums they want to answer and their research discoveries um, so that we can improve the lives uh, of women, certainly in BC, but I hope with impact beyond. Okay, Steph? And what's in the bank um, began principally with tissue. We have um, flash frozen tissue in about 19,000 patients. Amazingly, almost every woman who comes to consent for their surgery tends to agree to tissue banking. And again, this amazingly generous and vulnerable step. 
We sometimes have matched uh, what's called formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue, the FFPE, allowing for validations. And obviously, a ton of work can be done in FFP as well. Reactive process of, of a fluid collection in advanced stage disease can be collected, spun down to a cell pellet for interesting work. And then the very exciting work in um, blood samples, principally about um, CT DNA, that is DNA that's shed from the tumor into the blood stream of a patient and can be used to follow disease volume response to therapy, um, looking at recurrences and very exciting discoveries in that. So I can turn it back to you, Gavin, and, and the next flow. Thanks very much, Jess. You were so punctual. I didn't have my uh, mute turned off at that point. Um, so uh, from there, the, the next person I'm going to ask to comment is uh, uh, another one of our outstanding scientists and assistant professor in obstetrics and gynecology, Aline Taluk. Uh, Aline, uh, it's yours. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, so yeah, so as uh, Jessica was mentioning, with the we've been sort of building on the success of the tumor bank and adding additional resources to help us better keep track of the data that we're collecting and every analysis that happens using our tissue bank or using data that we've collected, we're really safeguarding these assets for future use and for secondary usage. So we've developed the Clinical uh, Informatics and Outcomes Research Core to do specifically that. And the idea is to come up with tools to make it easier uh, for um, different investigators to do chart reviews, to collect tissue in a way uh, that is uh, harmonized across all of the different studies, and that enables us to keep and safeguard the data for future use because of the way it's collected. It's collected using some standardized vocabulary, and so that if someone else wants to build on that work, they don't have to start from zero. They could just take whatever was done already and just do whatever difference is needed to do what as their study and to assess their study aims. So we have several resources and I'll try to be very brief, but I'm happy to chat with anyone who wants more information later. So we have clinical informatics resources and those include tissue banking uh, with open specimen. They include um, uh, chart reviews and data uh, abstraction with uh, uh, REDCap and patient reported outcomes with REDCap. Uh, we also have biostatistical support. And if you want to have access to any of our, of whether you want access to data, to tissue, uh, to support, whether it's on the informatics or whether it's on the biostatistical side, uh, you have access. Uh, either we have a website where you can go and log in and request all of this information and we keep track of it. And, and we'll try to be prompt uh, in, in, in providing those services. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, because uh, someone was interested in that and they asked me to mention about this, we're constantly thinking of growing our data collection. So we are expanding uh, um, the uh, sources of data without having, without impacting, uh, without impacting uh, clinicians in their day to day. So right now we're taking a lot of our data from the BC Cancer Registry. We have several projects underway to try to get more data from uh, from mining pathology reports, uh, just parsing the synoptic reports that we get and automatically populating our databases from them. Uh, we are also including and expanding our consent. So right now, all of the consent happens with the in the clinic, and we want to open that to the population so that, again, we have, with informed consent, we get access to more data through administrative data sets and, and other sources. So those are the plans uh, going forward. Uh, and then continuing to integrate our database by looking at uh, also providing a view into the molecular findings that we're getting from the data, from all of the analyses that, that we're running at OfCare. Thanks very much, Eileen. That's uh, just great. And uh, I think I, I, I should point out to all of you on the call, I mean, 
This is about our provincial framework to enhance research in, in, in the domain of gynecologic cancer. And what you're getting are snapshots of the various assets in our environment. And, and, and please, there, there is a uh, email info at gynecancerinitiative.ca uh, that Stephanie will link you with whomever you think might be of value to you and in, in, in what you're doing. And uh, uh, please take advantage of that. I'm sounding like I'm on a, a, a telethon fundraiser or something. So I'll stop there. And uh, David Huntsman is uh, going to uh, take over. Hi, yeah, so I'm David Huntsman, and I'm uh, the scientific director of OveCare, and I'm so proud that our work is now within this larger framework of a team effort to reduce death and suffering from gynecologic cancers by 50%. This is really exciting and motivating. Um, so in addition to my own research, I've been trying to build up molecular pathology infrastructure, which is very connected to both the Lean's work and also the Tumor Bank. So in the past, we had the GPEC lab at the VGH, which was really proficient at building tissue arrays and doing immunohistochemistry and some fluorescence in situ hybridization to take discoveries which came from uh, individual or small collections of cancers and to determine their clinical impact over large cohorts. Um, we refreshed that infrastructure a few years ago with help from the VGH Foundation who helped us purchase a laser capture microdissection system and we're very grateful for that. Mike Anglicio and my team and others used it for uh, um, identifying mutations in endometriosis and in some subpopulations of cancer cells. Um, but that infrastructure had gone a bit stale and so we were fortunate to get funds from the CFI to completely replenish it and through a retention um, ask um, extra space at the Vancouver Hospital. And so we built up what we could now call the Molecular Advanced Pathology Core. And in addition to the things we could do in the past, like laser capture, we've added digital spatial profiling, which will enable us to get a better sense of heterogeneity within tumors. Tumors aren't really an army of clones. There's a lot of diversity in those different populations mean different things, in base, particularly under treatment advanced microscopy, including a very sophisticated microscope, which will enable us to get into multiplex immunohistochemistry. Of course, Brad Nelson's team has a lot of expertise in that already. Uh, we're wanting to adopt it to look at um, epithelial cell subpopulations rather than a strictly an immune um, phenotyping uh, type tool. And um, everything we're doing is, is, is connected to Ali uh, Bashishati's um, efforts to uh, build out AI and digital pathology. Um, in the same way radiology became digitized, we want the same to happen to pathology. And that means there's gonna be a whole new data source to learn from as well. Um, the old GPEC lab was the training environment where most of today's pathology leaders cut their teeth and built their careers. And through this new infrastructure, we look forward to creating opportunities for a new generation of pathologists to become leaders. And uh, to help facilitate that, we've got space. We have some scholarships for junior pathologists and other things. And we're really excited about working with the community to help to determine the impact of discoveries they've made um, through the uh, you know, uh, state of the art analysis of tissue samples. And so this is your core resource and uh, we look forward to working with you. Great, and thank, thanks very much, David. So you're hearing about the tissue bank, you're hearing about informatics, you're hearing about molecular pathology and artificial intelligence. And uh, the, the next extension of this, I'm gonna ask Anna Tinker, our uh, uh, provincial gynae tumor group leader, uh, to talk about the GCI clinical trials group. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me on the call. It's my pleasure to be here to speak to you guys about our um, clinical trials group. So, <clears throat> you know, the GCI has worked very hard to expand research in gynecologic cancers, and this includes clinical trials in BC for the benefit of our patients and, and also to help our researchers um, have better access to platforms where they can start looking at important clinical questions in, in the clinical setting. So this group is, uh, is here to support interventional studies. Um, this includes the, the conventional things we're familiar with, like surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, but it does expand beyond that to all of our allied um, health professionals, physical therapy, nutrition, counseling, patient-reported outcomes, quality of life measures. Um, 
we have a team of research staff that will help to support the trials. We have research coordinators. Um, we have the capacity for uh, the database development, specifically for clinical trial database um, structures that are important. We have a collaboration with um, the BC Cancer Provincial Trials Unit, uh, which uh, gives us a lot of expertise and, um, and guidance on how to function within this environment and have been a great partner for us in helping us move forward. Um, we have a process in place where we've been very fortunate to receive some funding support from a donor and that's allowed us to uh, issue some competitive grants. Right now, these are being awarded two times per year. We have a process of uh, applications where people submit a letter of intent, and we have a panel of reviewers, which includes clinicians, scientists, statisticians. We have lay representatives. Um, and whenever possible, those who are awarded one of our grants, we provide them with support so we can help them with their protocol writing, their submissions to the REB statistical support. So we're really trying to develop something that's very complementary to some of the existing clinical trials work that's going on in BC in more the conventional setting of, of each of our cancer centers. Um, and, and, but we're trying to grow resources. We're trying to promote innovative studies that may not otherwise go through some of the more traditional pathways. And, and really this is a goal here is to engage patient, patients and to engage our scientific community um, in advancing patient care. Anna, thanks very much. And that, that's a great segue. One of our uh, amazing colleagues in uh, Abbotsford, medical oncologist, uh, Dr. Jenny Koh, has spent a lot of time uh, thinking and leading dialogue around patient reported outcomes. Jenny? Um, thanks so much for uh, including this slide. Uh, we have um, uh, met together with representatives from six BC cancer centers, uh, consisting of medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, uh, sort of specializing in gynecologic cancers, uh, nursing representatives and managers, administra administrative staff, um, technical support team from for web-based policy and patient partners. Um, and we have had multiple iterations of what is truly important for a patient to report and communicate to uh, the healthcare professional teams for their cancer journey in gynecologic cancer, um, as well as literature review and um, aspects of quality improvement uh, for uh, patients knowing that um, being able to have these symptoms uh, and uh, PRO reported to the healthcare professionals improve patient outcomes. So um, we have selected uh, specific symptom related questions and quality of life questions um, that were um, approved and uh, modified by all of the parties, including patient partners. Um, and they were chosen specifically from previously validated tools such as uh, FACTO and uh, CTCAE. Um, these have been um, used in clinic uh, specifically uh, from the time of consultation through the active treatment and the, uh, par as part of uh, patient journey in the clinic. Um, we have completed phase one of um, the study as part of implementation and quality improvement research. And now we are awaiting uh, the next part uh, in which we will implement it in uh, multiple centers across the province. Um, uh, we have named this uh, tool uh, GCI Pro, and we're excited to uh, start using it in clinics, uh, both as standard of care to um, uh, improve collaboration between different uh, healthcare professionals, but also as research tool, uh, instead of having um, many um, sometimes cumbersome questions um, to patients uh, that may consist of 50, 60 different questions uh, to have a more comprehensive and shortened version for uh, patient quality of life. Jenny, that's absolutely great. And it provides just a marvelous springboard to uh, invite uh, Stephanie Lamb and Deborah Walker and Michelle Lim to uh, talk about the uh, Patient and Family Advisory Council. And just a quick shout out, uh, Deborah and Michelle, just thank you for what you're doing. 
Thank you. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, so the Patient Family Advisory Council is a group of over 15 family and patient partners who have been affected by a gynecologic cancer <coughs> in some way. Um, so the purpose of the group is really to enable patient-oriented research by working with partners who will help advise, consult, and co collaborate with researchers on various projects. So our partners um, like Michelle and Deborah have generously volunteered their time to help um, researchers align their projects and initiatives to patient identified priorities as and perspectives. So if you have a project that would benefit from patient engagement, or if you have a project where you're not entirely sure if patient engagement would be helpful, um, please do reach out to us and we can help figure out if there is an appropriate, if it is an appropriate project to take to our patients and um, we can help brainstorm effective strategies for this. Um, so before we move on, we thought it would be appropriate to hear from two of our patient partners. Um, so we'll just start off with Michelle Lim and then we'll go to Deborah Walker. So Michelle, do you want to start us off? Thank you, Stephanie, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is, is Michelle Lim, and three years ago I was diagnosed with re rectal cancer, uh, hence the uh, picture of me in the uh, hospital with my very special pillow there. Um, fast forward uh, three years to where we are today, um, and fortunately I've given the all clear at a recent oncology visit, so I've been a little over three years. It's been a bit of a journey with chemo and radiation and some operations, but I feel very, very blessed to be in such great health and that's been my rationale for uh, volunteering with the um, patient partner program because I totally feel that I owe my life to the BC Cancer Agency and the very, uh, very intelligent and smart people who've uh, let me get to where I am. Um, my interest in gynecological cancer, although the, I'm a rectal cancer survivor, uh, is first and foremost um, my grandmother. Uh, in 19, sorry, in 2003, uh, she passed away from uterine cancer. It was being her only grandchild, therefore the favorite grandchild, I guess. Uh, it was really difficult to see her go through that. And when I heard about the GCI, I was motivated to join because I don't want to see other women, be it friends or family or the women of BC, go through what my grandmother had to go through. Um, secondarily, my interest in gy gynecological cancer, um, some of you may recognize from the picture, um, the, the wedding picture, there's a gentleman on the far left there uh, by the name of Ken Lim, and he's an ob -GYN, and uh, throughout his career, I've had the chance to meet so many ob -GYNs in the province and across Canada, and I've seen and heard firsthand the implications for gynecological cancer in women. So if we can do something to stop this and make lives a lot better, that, that's my rationale and I'm really, really thrilled to be here and wish you all the very best with making some advances that I know you will. Thanks, Michelle. We'll go to Deborah now. Uh, yes. Um, I was originally diagnosed with cervical cancer in the late 90s in Alberta. Uh, went along quite well, humming along for about two decades. My sister was then uh, diagnosed with uterine cancer, also in Alberta. And six months after that, I was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer here in BC. So three of those four pillars on that diamond that Stephanie showed, I've got experience in either directly or as a caregiver. Um, I, uh, my left picture is showing how uh, about halfway through my chemo uh, in November of 2017 when I went in uh, under the, the work of uh, the amazing Dr. Diane Miller. Um, who was every time I look at the scar on my body, I think very fondly of her, whether she wants it to or not. So um, uh, it's fuzzy, that picture, because everything was a blur. Um, uh, even though it was my second time with cancer, it was an advanced stage cancer, and it was a completely different set of uh, circumstances that I went through. I completed my active treatment in January of 2018. In February of 2018, I started off as a clinical trial patient. Uh, so I've been on a clinical trial under the, under the uh, watchful eyes of both Dr. Hoskins and Dr. Tinker since that time and have uh, gradually become uh, less foggy and less fuzzy and moved on to uh, what was happening in the right hand side was I got my tattoo showing the path of enlightenment which is here um, 
The uh, result of that is I've also spent, or the, one of the reasons that I was able to become a lot more clear is I've spent a lot of time both as a, a member of the PFAC as well as the clinical trials group, as well as I have, uh, I sit on the clinical trials group out of Prince George. I also sit on uh, as an advisory member and patient partner with 3CTN out of Toronto. And I also um, participate as a member of the patient involvement program with the Canadian Cancer Research Conference. Um, so uh, it's people like us that are sitting on the PFAC and we want to help in any way that we can. Uh, and so I'm pleased and honored to be able to be able to talk to you today. And I look so forward to seeing all the results of your research. Deborah, Michelle, Stephanie, thank you uh, so much. Um, as we're generating all of this knowledge, um, it doesn't do much unless we translate it into action. So kind of with that, uh, we have uh, Melissa Nelson with us from uh, the Women's Health Research Institute, which is part and parcel as a, as a key pillar within uh, the GCI. Thanks so much for having me. Um, as Gavin just mentioned, I'm Melissa Nelson. I'm the communications assistant with the Women's Health Research Institute. Um, and I work closely with Nicole Presley, who's our manager of knowledge translation. Um, so at the WHRI, we support the translation, dissemination, and use of research findings to our membership. Um, so we offer KT capacity building through one-on-one -on -one consultations, as well as workshops for KT planning and communications. Um, some of you may have seen that this summer we offered our first series of workshops on social media for health research. Um, we also offer KT project facilitation, such as barriers and facilitators assessments, stakeholder engagement, and we've worked on um, a couple of different dissemination campaigns from content development through to evaluation, as well as knowledge brokering. And we offer um, access to and development of a variety of KT resources. So we have an annual research symposium. We offer biannual events to the public for our membership to disseminate their findings in an accessible way. Uh, we'll be moving those virtually given the current situation. And we host monthly uh, research rounds with uh, BC Women's Hospital. And then we also are really active online. We have a website, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. We launched a podcast earlier this year called At Women's Research, which are available for our members to use as vehicles for their own knowledge translation work, which we can support. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either of us. Melissa, thanks uh, very much for uh, framing that. And uh, uh, obviously your contacts and Nicole's contacts are there for people to reach out. Um, next, as, as I hope I said right from the get-go, I mean, this is a, a provincial effort and uh, we're, we're very, very fortunate. There's a, a, one of the research pillars is the, uh, the Daily Research Center. Uh, Dr. Brad Nelson is a distinguished scientist there and a professor both at UVic and, 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 and UBC. Very few people can say that actually, uh, but at any rate, uh, Brad. Hi, well, good afternoon or evening, everyone, wherever you may be. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to talk briefly about what's going on at the Dealey Research Centre. We're based in Victoria. We're part of the BC Cancer Agency, and I've been involved in the uh, Oath Care Group and uh, various initiatives uh, preceding the GCI for a number of years. So just really pleased to, to be part of, of what's happening today and, and into the future. Um, our focus at our research centre is on uh, the immune system, the immune response to cancer, and the development of new immunotherapies for, for gynecologic cancers. Um, and uh, there's a number of activities around that, but uh, I'll just highlight two today. One is that um, we've developed uh, what we call our molecular and cellular immunology core. And this is, uh, uses a number of genomic and histologic techniques to really probe in great detail the uh, immune response um, to cancer. And this image here is showing a, a tumor sample from an ovarian cancer patient, which has been stained to highlight a number of different immune, immune markers, um, immune cell types in the tumor. And just uh, illustrating the complexity of the tumor microenvironment, as we call it, um, and to show what we can learn by looking at it in this way. Um, here we're highlighting a couple of different uh, immunotherapy targets uh, in, in turquoise, uh, one called a, a part of the PD-1, PDL one pathway, which is the target of, of immunotherapy drug that's working quite well 
in, in other cancers, but unfortunately not well with ovarian cancer. And in orange, a pumpkin color, a, a different target that we and others have, have identified through these kind of studies that we think for various reasons might actually be a, a more appropriate thing to go after in this disease. So these are the kind of approaches we take. My, my colleagues in this are Julian Lum, uh, Peter Watson, John Webb, and the core is run by Katie Milne and uh, Finn Hamilton. And we are open for business, uh, uh, a fee for service for anyone who uh, uh, wants to apply these sorts of methods. Uh, I think we've got you know, a, a really great team and, and are happy to collaborate. The second thing I'll mention is we're also a site uh, for making genetically engineered uh, immune cells for clinical trials. So uh, going from the discovery side on the left to uh, the actual clinical translation, we've built a uh, clean room facility in Victoria that allows us to produce T cell products for clinical use. And this is a shot of the team involved in that activity and some of the instrumentation and, and some inside shots of our clean room. And um, we're currently um, uh, have a clinical trial open with CAR T cells for uh, leukemia and lymphomas. That was our starting point, and we're very excited about that. Uh, but our, our goal in the gynae space, and this is working also with Anna Tinker and uh, uh, Jessica McAlpine and others in the clinical service, to develop a CAR T cell-like therapy for ovarian cancer. Uh, we're working hard at that. There's significant challenges uh, to doing that. Um, even globally, you know, these approaches aren't yet working against solid tumors. Uh, but we feel as, as part of this larger collaborative that we've got the, the people, the expertise, the resources uh, to really pull this off. So very exciting uh, uh, time for our program. Thanks, Gavin. Thanks very much, Brad, and uh, thanks for highlighting your uh, colleagues there in Victoria as well. So, um, and uh, obviously what's taking place in Victoria as well as elsewhere in the province is largely, uh, or in many ways, fueled by graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, um, and we're, we're fortunate one of our uh, colleagues and assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Jillian Hanley, has been leading this. Uh, Jillian. Hi, thanks, Gavin. Um, yes, yeah, so we're, in, we're really interested at the GCI in investing in the future of gynecologic cancer research in British Columbia so that we can sustain the excellence that we have here in this province. And that, of course, means focusing on um, our graduate trainees here in British Columbia. Um, so with that in mind, we uh, developed a webinar series um, to address what the graduate students here in British Columbia were telling us was something that they needed. Um, so we uh, asked trainees, about 30 or 40 trainees responded, saying that what they really felt was necessary was a broad introductory level course that covered all gynecologic cancers. And so that's what um, we ended up offering in May. Uh, we originally, sorry, we originally were going to offer it as an in-person course in May in Vancouver. And of course, uh, that was quickly sidelined by COVID. Um, but we were able to pivot to a webinar series, which also meant that we could open it up nationally. Um, and we invited trainees from all across the country to join us and we had a really tremendous uptake. So I think, um, you know, it shows that there are a lot of graduate students out there who are interested in learning more about uh, gynecologic cancer more broadly. Uh, we ended up with about 250 registrants. Um, over our eight weekly webinar series, we had somewhere between 100 and 200 participants joining us nearly every week. Um, we had amazing experts um, from British Columbia giving talks on a variety of topics. We heard from patient partners. Um, and so I think it was a really, a really fun experience. Um, and we will be moving forward with future training initiatives. Um, so please, if you are a graduate student who's interested in gynecologic cancer, uh, get on our mailing list. We'll let you know um, all of the new initiatives that are coming forward as soon as we're ready to, to release them. Uh, we will be doing something again this year in, in the form of training. So um, get on our list. If you know trainees who are interested in gynecancer, please encourage them to get on our mailing list. 
And if you have any ideas that you want to share with us, we would love to hear from you. And that's all I'll say. Thank you. Jillian, thanks uh, very, very much. And I, I, I just need to say, I mean, Jillian and uh, the rest of the team working on this knocked it out of the park uh, with a webinar series. It became a, uh, a, a required course for programs at McGill and Dalhousie. And <laughs> I, I think, good on you. <laughs> so uh, with, with that, I'll uh, move to the person that kind of makes everything happen, which is uh, Michelle Wu and uh, Michelle. Okay, thank you, Gavin, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to share with you some of the grant funding opportunities that we currently have available within the GCI that is specific for gynecologic cancer research projects and are open to the gynecologic cancer research community here in BC. Um, so right now, the largest program that we have is the Accelerating Grants Program, and um, Anna briefly mentioned this earlier, and this has a total funding envelope of about $250,000 this year, and these grants are really to support research that's related to patients. So these could be interventional, observational, and translational. Um, in particular, this program is geared towards supporting research that is made in BC. And a good example of this is one that um, was funded by this program last year that's um, being led by Dr. Jessica McAlpine and working with oncologists across the province. And what this fund enabled Dr. McAlpine to do is was bringing her uh, Promise endometrial cancer molecular classifier um, into a prospective trial that's now open in BC and actively enrolling patients. So next, um, we have three funding opportunities, um, two through Care and one through the UBC Division of Gynecologic Oncology. And these um, funding opportunities support early and mid-career researchers. So to really allow young budding scientists to put their ideas to the test, um, these grants are typically $20,000 each, and it, they can support a small clinical study, a project with a hypothesis but no preliminary data, or even a smaller circumscribed project um, where the funding will help provide a definitive answer. Preference is given to projects that have the potential to become larger externally funded projects. Um, a good example of this is one that is led by Dr. Ali Bashashadi on his work on AI imaging and ovarian cancer. He received a $20,000 Kararesi grant in 2018, and this really enabled him to generate the preliminary data that he needed to support a three-year CIHR project grant, um, which he successfully received in 2019. And finally, um, I, I'm delighted to introduce the Miller Mendel Gynecologic Oncology Academic Excellence Fellowship Awards. Um, these are two year fellowship awards for gynecologic oncology trainees with exceptional academic potential. Uh, I, I'm really pleased to announce that Dr. Amy Jamison is the first recipient of this award, and she has just come out of quarantine after traveling here from New Zealand. Um, we're delighted to have her join the team. And um, finally, I'd just like to take this opportunity on behalf of the, gyne the entire gynecologic cancer research community in BC to thank all the donors who, who have made um, these, these funding programs um, possible. Um, and many of the initiatives that were described earlier by the group, um, you know, thank you to the donors for your vision and really for allowing us to dream big. Um, with that, I'm delighted to hand the town hall over to our four fundraising partners. And uh, I, I should just say uh, th thanks very much, Michelle and uh, Amy, New Zealand's Laws, Canada's Gain. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, as, as you've sort of uh, shared, uh, Michelle, the uh, importance of our foundation partnerships. This doesn't happen w without this. And I, I, I think I see on the screen that uh, all of the foundations are, are represented. And thank you very much. Um, and uh, Laura from the uh, BC Cancer Foundation is going to offer some co uh, commentary as well. Hi, thank you, Gavin, and thank you, Michelle. And um, yeah, I'm so privileged to be here today. Um, as Gavin mentioned, my name is Laura Ralph, and I'm a director at the BC Cancer Foundation. And I'm sure you all know we're the fundraising partner for BC Cancer. 
Um, but I am also speaking today on behalf of the four fundraising partners of the Gynecologic Cancer Initiative, which include, of course, BC Cancer Foundation, BC Women's Hospital Foundation, the UBC Faculty of Medicine, and the VGH and UBC Hospitals Foundation. And I'm actually joined here by my counterparts at each of these organizations. So I just wanted to introduce them to you. I don't know if there's a way for them to wave hello so you can connect the face to the name. Um, but in any case, I'll just introduce their names. Uh, Lindsay Hamilton from BC Women's Hospital Foundation, Tim Staunton from the VGH and UBC Hospitals Foundation, and Leanne Dennis from the UBC Faculty of Medicine. So we collectively, our four organizations are here to support the GCI and our, our job is to increase philanthropic funding for your work to advance gynecologic oncology research, education, and ultimately improve patient outcomes at the end of the day. Um, together, we raise, our institutions raise over $200 million a year for medical research, education, and care, and this is province-wide, um, and a significant portion of this is dedicated to, to cancer research. Our job is to work with you, the GCI's leadership, the clinicians, the scientists, to understand your fundraising needs and to um, help articulate these in a compelling manner to uh, engage donors and bring in money for you. Um, we also work closely with you to cultivate and engage these donors, including your grateful patients, their loved ones, our industry partners, and really any non-governmental funding opportunities that are out there. Um, as has already been touched on, philanthropic support is critical in so many ways. Um, we know government funding is just a small portion of what fuels research and, um, and often is the seed funding. Philanthropy is often the seed funding to leverage um, external grants and fund needs that are not covered by the government traditionally. So I know I speak on behalf of um, all of the partners organizations here when we, to say that we are privileged to work with you and we are committed to your vision. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, to, to help you and to learn more about what we do and how we can work together. Thank you. I think you're on mute there, Gavin, still. Gosh, that was the most critical part of what I had to say. Uh, just uh, thanks very much, Laura, and thanks to uh, uh, each of the uh, foundations and development offices that uh, work so hard to, to allow us to, to make all of this happen. It's, it, it's, it's a critical piece, and um, I appreciate you, Laura, sort of framing it. This is a, this is a provincial effort, and uh, I, I also note that all four of those organizations have a provincial uh, footprint and, 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 and role. I, I'm just going to take, I'm most grateful that everybody stayed right on time. I'm sorry, this is a packed 60 minutes. I'm just going to uh, just toss out a couple of the things that are coming down the pipe in terms of uh, GCI. I think it's probably fair to say our funding is on a year to year basis. So we're actually moving to uh, a, a, a renewal again from the core funding from uh, uh, UBC. Um, I, I will note that uh, we're actually working to launch the uh, GCI website and uh, I think you see that scrolling be before your screen there. I'm, I'm, I'm having problems following it quite that quickly but uh, Stephanie thank you very much for uh, uh, flagging that. This is something that will be live and available and we anticipate or expect that to be both external and internal facing to to, to help and support researchers and scientists but also to uh, help engage and work with uh, patients and uh, patient partners. Um, along with that, we'll also be launching the GCI uh, social media strategy, and that is uh, something that's critically uh, engaged with uh, Melissa and her team from uh, Women's Health Research uh, Institute as we're looking at uh, a, a variety of approaches there, podcasts and uh, online offerings, and, and, and thank you to the team for working on that. And uh, then also one of the things that uh, Michelle and Stephanie have been very much focused on are our gynecologic cancer initiative research rounds. And we know that there's a variety of talented persons that 
pass through our environment uh, virtually or, or in person, less so the latter these days, uh, that are drawn here by the caliber of the scientists and clinicians that we work with. And, and, and we're going to try and make their uh, presence much more open and available through the uh, GCI research rounds. And there's an example that you can see with uh, Dr. Lee uh, for October the 16th, and you'll see these announcements uh, coming out. So that takes us to 251, and, and we have nine minutes uh, left in our, uh, in our uh, hour here. So I might just uh, uh, suggest that if people have comments or questions, it might be easiest if you just use the uh, chat uh, facility and uh, put your question up there, and I'll, I'll, I'll read that and try and uh, toss it out for whoever it's best uh, directed to. So comments or questions? Or Stephanie, did you have any other comments there? I didn't receive any questions from everyone, but uh, just as a quick reminder to folks on the call, um, our contact information as well as our new social media handles are on the screen here. Um, so I encourage everyone to um, go visit our websites, um, sign up for our mailing list on our website and follow us on social media to stay up to date on different events and different resources that um, you'll be able to tap into. Or if anybody just wants to speak up, you can do what I didn't, which is turn my microphone on. Um, I remember the origins of OVCARE, which was a dinner meeting and then a meeting in the cafeteria of uh, the Vancouver hospital with some notes scribbled on a napkin. And there's no way we could have dreamt this would have been this, uh, become this kind of inclusive, multifaceted, multi-institutional powerhouse, which um, is gonna have such a big international impact. And uh, you know, I'm so proud to be part of this. And so I want to thank you all. It's uh, really impressive. I mean, there are so many parts of this, which are so far beyond my can in terms of being, I wouldn't be able to make them happen. Um, it's just lovely to watch. Um, so. I just want to say thanks as one of the earliest team members for all of your efforts. And thanks, David. I mean, I, I think this is classic. The GCI is you, uh, all of you, and it's two plus two equals five.